All right, Alexander, let's talk about the drone strikes in, uh, in Moscow. Um, drone strikes and missile strikes from the Russians all over Ukraine. But the big differences between the, the drone strikes towards Moscow and what the Russians are doing in, uh, in Ukraine. What, uh, what are those differences? Well, I mean, the, what, the, the, the big difference is the difference in scale. I mean, the Russian drone and missile strikes across Ukraine are huge. And they are causing substantial damage. I mean, even Ukraine is now slowly coming round to admitting the fact. We've had the governor of Khmelnytsky, which is an important town where there was an enormous explosion you know, about 10 days ago, which we discussed extensively in previous programs. He's now confirmed that there was a major attack on the airfield there, that five, some people say seven, aircraft, the word is that they were Soviet-era Sukhoi 24s, which are used to launch uh, British Storm Shadow missiles, that they've all been destroyed, that there's been extensive damage done to the runway facilities. There was a huge explosion last night, apparently, in Kiev. Uh, nobody quite knows what exactly was hit, but um, apparently it was, you know, the explosion created a shockwave and earth tremors that actually would register on the Richter scale. So, you know, kind of small earthquake type thing. Massive damage across Ukraine, facilities being attacked everywhere. The port in Odessa has been damaged. Uh, Nikolaev has been badly hit. Warehouses, all kinds of buildings, all kinds of logistical centers destroyed. And another big missile strike on the uh, airfield near Kiev, where the Patriot missile um, is supposed to be located, the Patriot missile system. And by the way, on that, we've now had some satellite pictures, and they do appear to confirm that after that earlier missile strike, Kinjal missile strike on that airfield, well, there are definitely two big impact craters there. So that appears to suggest that two missiles got through and these big craters, they seem to have done a lot of damage, though we don't know exactly what was damaged. So, you know, this is a hu these are huge Russian strikes. They happen every day. And we see, you know, some really, I really you know, distressing scenes of people in the metro, in bomb shelters and all things like this in Kiev. We see the former president of Ukraine, Petro Poroshenko, hiding in a bomb shelter and looking tired and frankly stressed looking. And the mayor of Kiev, Vitaly Klitschko, asked, you know, why are why are we hiding in shelters and people in Moscow able to sleep peacefully? And this was picked up, or perhaps it was instigated by Kirill Budanov, the intelligence chief, who's again made all kinds of warning threats to the Russians. And sure enough, last night we got, and early this morning, we got drone attacks on Moscow. But these were tiny little drones. They did minimal damage. One building was apparently hit. Nobody seems to have been killed or injured. Most of the drones were brought down so the Russians say, by electronic warfare systems, who's to say whether that is true or not. Others apparently impacted with trees and um, telegraph lines, telephone lines, or you know, electricity lines, which is quite likely. And whatever, the, the impact is minor. It, it, it is so minor as to be, again, another one of those pinpricks that Ukraine engages in. But of course... In a kind of a sense, it works because this morning I was looking at the media here in Britain and they're all full about the drone strikes on Moscow and the far bigger and far more extensive drone strikes and missile strikes on Kiev and across Ukraine have been overshadowed by the news of the drone strikes. Even though, as I said, this is a pinprick, these are pinprick attacks, whereas the Russian strikes are on an enormous scale. Yeah, but isn't it fair to say that, or isn't it correct to say that the 
the drone strikes in Ukraine actually have a, a, a target, which is to a military objective, like a military target and objective, which is to destroy the, the weapons facilities and warehouses of Ukraine, where I'm, I'm not understanding. I mean, I do understand, but from a military point of view, what, what is the purpose of these drones in Moscow? I mean, are they targeting military facilities? I don't think so. Are they, are they trying to destroy storage warehouses? I don't think so. I mean, if that was the case, then I understand the purpose of these drones. But it just seems like Budanov is just sending drones into, into Moscow just to create panic, fear, distract away from what's happening in Ukraine. There are other theories which claim that, that, that the British want Ukraine to, to hit Moscow so they can draw the Russians out of their defensive positions to shake things up a bit. I mean, my, my point is, is that the Russians are, I mean, you understand why they're sending missiles and drones to these areas because the Russians are claiming, is what they're claiming, that they're hitting uh, storage facilities where Ukraine, um, the purpose of the drones is what exactly? Well, that's the next important. Are you looking to hit storage facilities or not? No, I mean, you're not. I mean, it, 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 I mean, it, it, these drones are much too small. We're talking about very small drones. <laughs> They're not capable of inflicting any real damage. It's a purely psychological um, operation. The, the Russian one, as you correctly said, is on, uh, is on a completely different scale. It's clearly intended to facilitate Russians' war effort in this conflict. I mean, they're, they're attacking, um, as you said, ammunition supplies, fuel depots, uh, um, barracks where troops are concentrated, warehouses where weapons are stored. That's what they're doing. They're also working to deplete Ukraine's air defense, air defenses. And if, if all the, all the information suggests that they've been very successful, that they're gradually knocking out and uh, destroying Ukraine's air defense system. I mean, some of, the, some of these strikes have been happening in Russia, that the Russians have been conducting, have been happening now in daytime. So, you know, that, that all suggests that the Ukrainian air defense system is starting to degrade, even in Kiev, which is its most well-defended position. Whereas the attack on Moscow is a mixture of attempt to stir panic, create fear, and at the same time provide some degree of tokenism, tell people in Kiev, well, look, we may be huddling in bomb shelters, but don't think that Moscow isn't affected as well, what Vitaly Klitschko said. I, I have to say, for me, the, the contrast in these two operations demonstrates again Russia's overwhelming strength and Ukraine's feebleness <laughs> because what what they're doing isn't having any real effect and this has been true of all these pinprick attacks that they've been launching right across uh, Russia over the last few weeks they they're, they're even less they're less effective than similar operations that Ukraine undertook last summer on the eve of its offensive then. I mean, if you remember, at that time, they were able to cause real damage to the Russians. I mean, there was a very successful attack, for example, on an airfield in Crimea. But since, since then, over the last few weeks, one gets the sense that the Russian air defense system, its electronic warfare capabilities, its missiles, its radars are now working at a very high level of efficiency and are successfully shooting things down. No, you remember, notice, you remember how Ukraine was launching those uh, um, Soviet era uh, uh, supersonic drones deep into Russia and hitting Engels Air Base. It's a long time since we saw anything like that happen. So it looks as if the Russian air defense systems have basically closed Russian airspace to anything now except the most minor pinprick attacks. And, you know, you, some of these drones will always get through, but they're not able to do very much. Yeah, I mean, it keeps... 
It keeps people in the collective West in the dark as to what is really happening in this conflict, these little pinprick attacks in a way, because, you know, the, the media runs with a story, um, drones hit Moscow and everyone in the collective West that isn't watching this channel and other channels like ours, they believe, OK, well, uh, yeah. you know, Ukraine is winning. All yeah. is going well. Yeah. They're hitting Moscow yes. now. I mean, that's that's the overall yeah. Big picture narrative. Ukraine is attacking Moscow. Again, yeah. they hit the Kremlin two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Now they're hitting Moscow again. Ukraine is winning. So all is good. But it it blinds people to the reality of the situation, which is that Ukraine is, is doing these PR drone strikes, which accomplish zero, zero, zero from a military strategic perspective. Zero. Absolutely uh, nothing. It doesn't help them at all in this conflict. While Russia is... Has a strategy. Yes, I mean you, 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 their strategy is, as you say, to deplete the air defense and to and to knock out the the weapons. Yeah, the, the weapons that are meant for the big offensive, which is continuously delayed yes. because the Russian strategy appears yes. to be working. Yes, yes. I mean, can I just point out? I mean, the the offensive was supposed to happen in April, on the thirtieth of April. In fact, then it was postponed until mid to late May. Well, we are almost now at the end of May. I'm not saying that, you know, maybe today or tomorrow the offensive will come, but it has been continuously postponed. And the first rumours about this offensive, by the way, date from um, early, uh, uh, from before the new year, that there was theories that, you know, the Ukrainians were thinking of launching this offensive even during the winter. And then it was going to be the spring, March, April, May, we're now in May, at the end of May, soon it will be June, and the offensive still hasn't been launched. And you're quite right, I mean, the Russians are pursuing a military strategy. But can I just say something? If you are following the news, if you're taking your news, let's say, from a conventional MSM source, what you will be hearing is that the Russians have been launching many missile strikes on Ukraine, but the Ukrainians are able, with the help of the Patriot system and all of those systems to shoot down 99% of these Russian missiles. There's even a piece in The Economist today which says that uh, Russian missile strikes, attacks on Ukraine have been ineffective. And so you get ineffective strikes by the Russians and at the same time you're hearing about these successful Ukrainian drone strikes on Moscow. So you are getting a completely distorted understanding of what's actually going on in the war. But that's the intention. That's that's the way this war has been conducted from the outset. There's times when it ebbs and flows. There's time in the eight in the autumn, for example, when Ukraine really was gaining ground and you could report that accurately. There are other times when I'm afraid it's all smoke and mirrors. It's the ghost of Kiev, Snake Island, being defended to the last man, <laughs> things like that. And I'm afraid these drone attacks are, are, are of the second category. Yeah, I agree with you, gaining ground. But, I mean, I'll, I'll push back a bit on that in that, you know, we can analyze that. Yeah. And we can explain why they're gaining ground. Yes. You know, why, why the Russians decided to cede that ground. While the collective West, they talk about it in terms of the, the, the great Kherson offensive and the great Kharkov counteroffensive and the siege of Kiev without explaining to their audience that it wasn't a siege of Kiev. Russia was never intending to take over Kiev with 40,000 troops. As a matter of fact, the Russian strategy during that time period almost worked, which was to get Ukraine to the negotiating table and to end this conflict quickly. Yes. If it wasn't for Boris Johnson coming in and ruining everything, that strategy of, of shocking and spooking, say spooking Alensky to the point where he goes to, to Turkey and they sign an agreement and the conflict was a month long and that was it, it almost worked. Absolutely. But I guess my point in all of this is that the disservice that they do in their reporting prolongs the conflict. Absolutely. Can I just say this? I mean, I, I, I want to make this absolutely clear. I don't think those offensives that Ukraine undertook in the autumn were successful, actually. They did regain a lot of territory, but the cost that Ukraine 
<laughs> took was disproportionate to what was captured. And the territory they we took... We reported that. Absolutely. The territory that they took, in the end, has turned out to be not to be useful to them. It, 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 and um, actually, Daniel Davis, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, I think, has written a good piece about this recently, in which he said, you know, that when you have actual urban warfare in places like Severodonetsk, Lysychansk, Mariupol, Popaznaya, uh, um recently in Bakhmut, the Ukrainians always lose and lose at disproportionate cost. The Russians always avoid getting trapped into these kind of situations. When they do defend, however, when they choose to defend, they defend effectively and successfully. So the Russians operate a much more flexible approach to war. And I've discussed this. I think they're doing this because they're professionals and the people who are running things in Kiev are not. But if you are, if you are running this war purely as presentation art, then the fact that you are able to gain hundreds of kilometers of territory, even if what you're gaining is largely empty fields, is something that you can sell as an advance. And perhaps that's a somewhat more concrete example of uh, what you're, you know, what you can, what you're selling than drone attacks, which, to be frank, achieve absolutely nothing. I mean, at least you're left in the one case with the empty fields, whatever price it is you paid for them. So, I mean, th that was the only point I was trying to make. So let's wrap up the video and um, let's talk about an article from La Repubblica, Alexander. And we did a video yesterday and we talked about how the the goal of of uh, of an off ramp to Ukraine, a possible off ramp to Ukraine, was some sort of uh, entry into the European Union, frozen conflict, pause conflict, something like that, where the Biden White House, which is in an election cycle, and various EU politicians and, and leaders can then sell it to their public as some sort of a victory. And maybe this is some sort of plan that Russia can can also agree to, given that um, NATO would be off the table. We talked about that in a video we did yesterday. Sure enough, that is exactly what Republica is reporting no, no. today. I mean, it, I, I think... I think it's one of those instances where, where, where we nailed the story perfectly on no. this one because Republica is saying that because of the election cycle and because the Biden White House is concerned about how things are going poorly in Ukraine, that maybe some sort of plan where negotiations with the EU are offered to, uh, to Alensky, NATO's off the table, and, uh, and maybe the Russians will, will agree to this if there's some sort of stalemate, secession, freeze, call it whatever you want. Absolutely. Negotiation, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. This would be the way out of this, but let's just get the counteroffensive over with, and then they can get to this plan, which is exactly what we said in the video well, precise. We the other day. Well, precise. Yes, it is exactly. And I mean, you know, I, I, I think that we can now say with confidence that this is the, this is the plan. This is what, this is the latest clever idea that, you know, Jake Sullivan and his, and his team have come up with. Um, you, you can see some people pushing back, you know, going back to Joseph Borrell. Joseph Borrell is saying that he's not optimistic about the situation. Who is? But he says that the Russians are in no mood to negotiate and they're going to fight on until they've achieved victory. Now, just for once, <laughs> I agree with Josip Borrell. It's about the only time I think I have ever agreed with Josip Borrell. But the reason he is saying that, and we always have to understand this, is he's not talking to you, to us. He's not talking to you. He's engaging in this discussion. He is an ultra hardliner. And what he's basically saying to Sullivan is, look, this clever plan you're coming up with isn't going to work because the Russians aren't going to be interested. And for once, he's actually being more realistic than Sullivan is. 
But that is the plan. That's the hope. You have to get the Ukrainians to uh, agree to negotiate. They're not going to agree to negotiate this side of the offensive. So you launch the offensive. If the Ukrainians make gains, you hope that will push the Russians into negotiations. And, you know, you can get a better outcome. If the offensive fails, well, you can tell the Ukrainians, well, we did all we could. Now you've got to sit down and talk with the Russians because you can't expect us to do more. And you hope that that will put people like Budanov in his box. So that's, that's, that's the plan. I mean, I think for once, as I said, Borrell is right. But that's what those comments are, from Borrell are all about. He is publicly arguing with the likes of Sullivan. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And he's, he's right. Yeah, he's right. But Sullivan is also, also right to a certain extent, not about Russia, but the fact that they've got to get this thing wrapped up Absolutely, yeah. before the election really kicks in. Yes. Because it could do a lot of damage to the Biden White House. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, <laughs> You can already see you can already see the line that's going to be taken. You lost you lost Afghanistan, and now you've lost Ukraine. <laughs> I mean, you are uh, uh, you're, you're, uh, you, our entire political position in the Middle East has collapsed. So you know you are you are a failure on every count, and um, it will affect people. I mean, I don't think American elections are decided on these things. But it will affect enough people, perhaps, to make the difference in what could be a very, very close election indeed. Um, and, of course, if we have a recession in the United States next year, we've been talking about recessions a lot about the United States. The U.S. has so far managed to avoid that, but people's living standards are under a lot of pressure. If, there's an economic, if there are more economic problems in the U.S., the Biden White House absolutely doesn't want a debacle in Ukraine as the election cycle starts to gear up and kick in. Yeah, because a lot of the, the Ukraine narrative is tied into all the money that's been given to uh, to Olensky. That's, that's where really, I mean, Afghanistan, we really didn't have the, the scrutiny on, on the money no. that was being sent to Afghanistan. It wasn't really part of the discourse. The money that consistently gets sent to Ukraine is always talked about. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's going to tie directly into the, the, the U.S. economy and, and the living standards of Americans. Absolutely. That is exactly correct. And I mean, you can already sort of see some of the Republican talking points. I mean, they're already floating the fact, I believe, that there's a donor who was an American businessman of Ukrainian backgrounds who has, I think, is it cars? He sells cars in Kiev or something like that. And he's a friend of Biden. I mean, to me, that I, mean, I don't actually believe, take that story too seriously. But it's the kind of thing that spun in an election. And you could see how it might gain traction. You know, that Biden was doing this all because he was helping his friends and helping himself and the money's all gone and all of these things. And the president isn't really interested in the problems of the American people. And whenever he goes abroad, he fails in everything he does. The last point being, by the way, true. And the most powerful, the most powerful arguments in politics, the most powerful attacks in politics are the ones which are true. <laughs> All right, we'll leave it there at the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rockfin Rumble Odyssey Pitch Shoot. And Telegram, go to Durant Shop, 10% off, use the code. Good day. Take care.